Thank Envision for inviting me uh, to complete this module today. I actually have quite a bit of embedded video uh, of, of a family and a pediatrician having some of these more difficult discussions, and so uh, we will have uh, more video time today than we've had in the past. Um, there are several handouts linked uh, to the PowerPoint today, and uh, I also have them that I can open up onto the computer, so if you don't have those copied, we should, we should be just fine reviewing the handouts today as well. So in the previous modules, we discussed early warning signs of autism and screening for autism, specifically using the MCHAT or Modified Checklist for Autism in Toddlers and the MCHAT follow-up interview. Um, and today we're going to uh, explore a little bit when you get results back from that MCHAT or a concerning screening test, how do you convey those concerns to the family? And secondly, if a family has received a diagnosis, how do you support that family and review the diagnosis with them? So I'm going to pause for just a minute. I think we have some new uh, folks signed on. Yeah, anybody who has not signed in yet uh, said your name. Uh, if you could unmute yourself by pressing par star pound and saying your name. Rebecca McKernan. Hi, Becky. And who else has joined us? Miriam Allen from Carlsbad, New Mexico. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you. So as we've said in the past, uh, these materials that we have today for our use, specifically the handouts that are attached uh, to the Envision calendar, may be freely copied and distributed as long as you give credit to the folks who developed them. And that would be the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities which were developed in partnership with the Health Resources and Service Administration, Maternal and Child Health Bureau. So that's my um, disclaimer that, of course, accompanies all of these uh, modules. So again, today we're going to talk about communicating concerns uh, from screening and diagnostic results, particularly around an autism spectrum disorder. And um, these principles, I hope, of having difficult discussions with families can apply beyond just an autism spectrum diagnosis, but for any of you who might be sharing difficult news with families, whether you're an EI team letting families know there's a delay, whether you're a medical person giving a difficult diagnosis, or just in our sort of day-to-day -day conversations uh, to help us be sensitive to some of these difficulties. So uh, let's review our learning objectives. Uh, first is to discuss an abnormal screening result with parents uh, that indicates concern that a child might have an autism diagnosis. And last time we discussed the difference between an abnormal screen, which is very sensitive, and an actual diagnosis with a parent. Uh, identifying reasons why parents might be reluctant to pursue a diagnostic evaluation after an abnormal autism screen. And I'll ask you guys if you've had that situation come up for you where you've really wanted a family to pursue more testing and, and how have you handled that. To describe some important techniques that a physician could use when discussing an abnormal screen uh, with different families. Secondly, once the family comes back to you, if they have been given a diagnosis, these are some specific techniques a physician can use mm -hmm. to support a family whose child has been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder identify various emotional responses parents may have after receiving an ASD diagnosis or any difficult diagnosis, and again, the stages of grief parents experience when their child is diagnosed with the disability. So why is this case important? You know, we're, we are really, really emphasizing screening, especially in the state of New Mexico with the ASQ and with the MCHAT, and then we get these concerning results and how do we convey that to parents? 
It can be a really emotional experience, especially if something is abnormal on the screen. So these types of communication skills are just essential to help parents understand that you have concerns or you share their concerns and to help support them as they see the appropriate specialists. Uh, as always, these are case-based, so we're going to start today uh, with, with Thomas. So forgive me for reading this out loud to you, or um, you guys can probably read it more quickly than I can. But as we go through this history, think about some of the um, uh, sort of red flags or sensitivities that you'll have to have with this family as you're talking with them. So Thomas is a 27-month-old little boy you followed since he was born in your clinic. The prenatal course was healthy. He was born term. Mom is 42. Medical history is noted for colic in the first few months of life. Uh, several episodes of otitis media and several respiratory illnesses. He's on no medications, no known medication allergies. He is not immunized and had goat's milk formula that his mother made for the first year of life. He's been healthy with no hospitalizations, no neonatal jaundice, anemia, elevated lead, or history of head trauma. Uh, his father is uh, 52. He's home full time with his mom and his big sister who's four and is typically developing. His father works as an applied mathematician at a local university. His mother has a master's degree in library Incomplete science. Incomplete command. Begin with the star key and end with the pound key. Are we okay? I apologize for that. We had a... We had a Audio picture. prompts are off. Picture looper. <laughs> Are we good? Okay. We should be okay. Now. Um, so she's been home uh, with the kids since the birth of Tommy's sister. The family history is notable for delayed speech and a paternal uncle who is now a professor of astrophysics. So I'm sure there's some uh, family history and, uh, and social history that uh, sets off some, some things in your mind. So uh, at the end of his two-year well-child exam, so he's there a little bit late for that, you review the MCHAT that they filled out. And um, you tell the parents you would like to talk with them to discuss the results of their questionnaire. They also had filled out an MCHAT at 18-month well-child care visit. And now you can use the results of both these checklists to talk with the parents. The first MCHAT uh, led to you referring Tommy and his family to a specialist. You discussed at that time that he had not passed the screen and there were some concerns about his socialization and communication. You had mentioned these might be signs of an autism spectrum disorder, so you've already broached that point with this family. And you also referred him for early intervention and a hearing evaluation. They were supposed to come back to you at 20 months, which is now seven months ago, to review the results of the hearing evaluation and to see where things were as far as early intervention. So in the six months, he hasn't had a hearing evaluation. He missed his developmental behavioral pediatric appointment. And you realize you might not have communicated your concern adequately. As an addendum, while you're having this discussion with his parents, Tommy's playing with the contents of a bag of his favorite toys, which are his shapes, colored cards cut into different polygons, which he names quietly to himself, square, triangle, and octagon during the visit. Um, so I'm just going to pause and ask if anybody would like to review any red flags or any uh, qualities of the history before we uh, watch this tape of the pediatrician and the family. So we can un please unmute if you have a, a, a comment or a question. Any thoughts about an uncle with speech delay who's now a professor of astrophysics? <laughs> that's kind of a yeah, astrophysics, so that could be definitely a kind of red flag of the history and the heredity in the family. Right. That's so this somebody. might exactly this might be this uncle might have Asperger's or be you know incredibly high functioning. Uh, he may not be on the spectrum at all, but it's it's a it's a family history that could go with that. And Tommy's parents are a little bit older, right? Mom is in her 40s and dad is in his 50s, which has been associated um, with an increased incidence of autism spectrum disorders. How much, how much, did they have like a percentage of 
parents that <clears throat> because of the, the age, the the increased um, chances that's of child a, have a um, Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know that number. I don't know if anybody um, signed on knows I heard what exactly. You said about parents, yes, but I didn't uh -huh. know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, let's go ahead and watch the tape. Um, and as you watch the tape, this is Dr. Weitzman. I'm going to ask you to please take some notes on what you think went well and what you think might have gone differently about the uh, uh, interview that she has. It's about six minutes, so you have time to take some notes, and then we'll we'll stop at the end and just say, you know, wow, she did a great job because of this, or she might have done this next thing better. So um, here is her style of, of engaging with this family. The following video role play was staged with an actual physician and with real parents of a child with autism. In this role play, Tommy, the patient, is 27 months old. His pediatrician saw him at his two-year well check, expressed concerns, and asked the parents to fill out a questionnaire. They're back in her office today. It's good to see you both. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes and look at the questionnaire again that you completed. Yes, we filled that out after the last visit, and he's made a lot of progress. He knows more words now. That's great to hear. A growing vocabulary is a really good thing to see. I'd like to take a look at some of your responses to the questionnaire and just see if anything's changed since you filled that out. Like what? You had answered that he's not really interested in other kids. Yeah, that's just his personality. He kind of likes to be alone and do his own thing. Mm -hmm. Tell me more what you mean by that. He gets very upset with any change in his routine. He likes playing with his toys for a long time, and he's very creative. When he's playing on his own, he just doesn't like any other kids to interfere. Mm -hmm. uh, but isn't that normal for a toddler? You're right. Uh, young children often do not like it when their routines are disturbed, and will get upset when that happens. And you know, when kids are really busy playing, they don't like to be disturbed. But some of the things you've told me about um, Tommy's social interactions raises some concerns, and I'd like to understand that a little bit better. He knows what he wants. He's very independent and likes playing by himself. He's kind of shy. Most of my family is shy. Tommy takes after my side of the family. Well, it's interesting. You've sort of noticed some similarities between Tommy and other people in your family. So let's look. You know, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your reporting that Tommy doesn't point or follow your point. Right. I don't know why he doesn't point. Whenever he wants something, he just carries me to what he wants. He gets really frustrated if we don't understand what he's asking for. That must be frustrating for the two of you to not always know what Tommy needs. Let's take a look. So you had also indicated that he doesn't respond to his name. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? No, he won't respond when you call his name and he won't even address me as mama. My wife and I, we kind of disagree about this. He responds well when you get close and you touch him. He just doesn't respond well from across the room. I see. Um, is he in daycare or preschool? No, we tried preschool. It was an absolute disaster. Um, so now we just keep him at home. He seems a lot happier being at home by himself. Tell me what you mean by a disaster. Well, the school, uh, he was more rigid. Um, he wasn't interested in playing with the other kids. Um, he just kind of liked playing with the shapes and blocks and that sort of thing. Um, but I just don't think preschool was a good fit for him. Boy, it sounds like that was really unpleasant for Tommy and for your family as well. How long was Tommy in preschool? Only about three months. Um, the teachers felt that he wasn't ready for preschool. I see. Well, I'm glad we've had some opportunity to review your responses to that questionnaire in a little more detail. And I really recommend the evaluation with the developmental and behavioral pediatrician. And based on what you've told me, I still have some concerns about Tommy's social and communication skills like we had talked about last time. So I am so happy to hear that Tommy is making lots of nice gains, has a growing vocabulary, but I do still have some areas of concern. Well, we were uncomfortable with something being wrong with him, and we really weren't sure what you meant about evaluation, but he's made a lot of progress. Do you still recommend this? 
Yes. The questionnaire that you completed does not provide us with a diagnosis, but it does suggest that there are some things about Tommy that we need to look at a bit more closely. I am still concerned that some of the behaviors you've described suggest that Tommy's a bit less social and less communicative than I would expect. What will they do? Put him on medication? We're not talking about medication now. We just need to get some more information and to understand Tommy a little bit better. So there may be one clinician or there may be a team of clinicians, I'm not sure. But they're going to really use that time to observe Tommy, to really look very carefully at his social and his communication skills. And they do this by using child-friendly toys and materials, so puzzles and maybe blocks and, and different kinds of things like that. You know, the evaluations are designed to try to make kids feel comfortable. They're not meant to be scary. They can be tiring because they can be long, but they're not meant to be frightening to children. Okay, well, all right. Sounds like you really want us to go through with this. I think it's a good idea, and I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to stay in touch and hear how the evaluation goes and get your impressions about, you know, how you think it went. Okay, doctor. We'll do it. So I don't know if you had an opportunity to take some notes about Dr. Weitzman and, and the family that uh, came in for this, uh, but I'd love to hear from you guys how you think this went and some of the things that you think uh, she did well about this follow-up interview. So feel free to un unmute. Um. She explained things, this is Peggy, he explained things really well, but I think Dad needed more information. I don't think he was um, comfortable. I don't think he was making the decision, I think, that because that, the doctor said. I, that That's what I got, you know, from, he just seemed very uncomfortable and, and also had different opinions as his wife as, as far as their child's behavior. That's a great observation, I think, you know, they even said at one point, we don't really, my wife and I don't really agree about this. I think he responds to his right. name, but she doesn't right. necessarily. Do you think there's anything right. she could have done that would have put the father more at ease, or is it just the sort of the situation now, that you make? When uh, I'm a part of an EI team, and, you know, we're, we're doing the assessment because, the, you know, for, for uh, any developmental reason, all five domains and <laughs> comes up, um, it, um, it's, it's, it's very hard because if, if the parent has an idea that you're confirming or has no idea, they just thought it was a late communicator or shy or something like that. And um, it's very, it's a sensitive thing to tell somebody and discuss it. So sometimes they just need a little bit more help or, or a little bit more time. Time, uh-huh. You know, like it's not coddling, but you know what I mean? I, you know, that's... That's exactly. Been in my exactly. Just time to sort of process one thing at a time. Right. Okay, there's a delay. Now, what could be causing right. the delay? That kind of thing. And I think, um, you know, we've even heard parents, they don't want to say the word autism out loud. They'll say to us, you know, we're, we don't want to label, we're worried about the A word. And, um, right. Just like, yeah. Yeah, no, go ahead. But no, because that's the same reaction. Because we've had, you know, I'm in, I'm in history, so I've had family die, and, and it, normally it was cancer, and that is the C word for, right. that for an adult. Scary, you know. Normally you associate with adults, and that nobody wants to hear that word. Any other word, be sick with any other thing. And I think the A word is the same kind of. Oh, oh my gosh. It's right, it triggers a lot of emotions, and you know that yeah. that may be one of the reasons why. You know, they went six or seven months and maybe didn't contact the EI team or didn't have the hearing evaluation. It, it, that reluctance, right? That fear of the diagnosis. Um, We've had some parents, yeah, that say that um, they thought it, they, they they thought their child would go out of it as they get a little bit old. They, you know, they, they that that was their hope. That was just a behavior that we got to through a stage, and um, exactly and what you said. Do you find, too, that sometimes families 
have had input from other family members like, oh, well, you were just like that and you started talking when you were four or your brother or what. So there's sometimes external pressure on families either reassuring them or pushing them towards the evaluation that can impact whether they actually do their follow-up uh, as recommended too. We've had several families that it, it um, normally that Oh, dad was a bit late talker, and he was very, very, very shy, mm -hmm. and you know what I mean, and his brothers or his father, that kind of stuff. We hear that a lot. Um, I'm in Delaware, and uh, I live in a, it's kind of busy, but then there's a lot of rural areas, too. Uh -huh. So I think, yeah, people really want it to go away, you know. <laughs> they they and, do want and their kids Friday, to go out of it. He didn't, you know, you know it's just... Um, and I think it, it takes, because sometimes we are the first ones to say that word and, you know, and, and doing the first maybe M-chat as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's a very, we have a wonderful developmental pediatrician and she's wonderful and she has been doing this a long time and she has a wonderful way with parents, but it's still, a, a, it's a big thing for a, a, a family to grasp and, and hear that their child even if they, they thought they came in by themselves because they had suspicions, they just, it's just a big thing. Thank and you. It, Sorry. And, and you have to put them at ease so that you can get them to your your developmental, right? So, you you know, you're that important right. liaison sort of bridge person. I thought that this pediatrician did a really nice job sort of bridging that family trait question. You know, she she sort of joined them where they were this could be a family trait, you're right, but still I'm concerned about, you know, his, you know, that he's having a more difficult time than another child with his socialization. So it seemed like she sort of met them where they were, but still uh, was able to convey her concern. I thought she did that well. Is there anything anybody else wants to say about what they think about this interview? Uh, I have a few more comments, but I, I'd really like to hear from you guys. It's a quiet, quiet group. Well, I think it's terrific that um, she met with both parents together. And she is not distracted. She's got lovely engagement with them. Um, she's very direct. She has nice eye contact with them. She's not answering her pager. Um, and she does this as a very, you know, she emphasizes the strengths that Tommy is showing. Uh, she refers to him by name, um, and I think she she also takes part of the responsibility for the fact that they didn't follow up, like perhaps she didn't convey her concerns well enough, or perhaps she didn't put them at ease enough about what the evaluation would be like, uh, and 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 we have many families who, when we finish our evaluation with ESEP. Their, ch their child had a much better time than they anticipated. So, you know, their child had a terrific time. And uh, again, it was child-friendly or play-based. They were with their child, never separated from their child during an ESEP evaluation. And these are some things that families need to hear, not that their child will be, you know, sat at a desk and given things to do without the parent's presence. So she reassured them about the nature of the evaluation. And she also sort of teamed with them in terms of saying, I'm right here, we have this long relationship, I've seen Tommy since birth, and I'll be, I'll be walking this road with you. Um, any other comments about, about this interview? Well, I'm going to pull up handout two on the screen. It's talking with parents about a concerning developmental screen. And... I swear that's what I'm going to do. So uh, I'd just like to go through a few of these things and see if you think she did this. Um, first of all, I think a word to use instead of a failed developmental screen is to use the word concerning. And I see all of you do this if you do autoacoustic emission testing for hearing when you talk about the child referring on one side rather than failing on one side of their hearing test. I think failure is a very scary word for parents 
And uh, concerning leaves the door open for getting more information rather than uh, a definite diagnosis. Um, so again, you have all these handouts on the link for your reference, but explaining in advance that all children get screened, not just Tommy, but because he was two, he was screened just by his age. Uh, making sure that parents understand that your screening tool wasn't a diagnosis, that this was a starting point for discussion. She made this uh, discussion in person, not on the phone. And if it was only one parent present, you could offer to meet the other one. And I bet in EI you have this a lot where you interact a lot with just one parent and you don't have sort of both parents engaged in what you're doing all the time. Um, being knowledgeable about early intervention when you refer kids to early intervention and uh, making sure that that's solid referral information for them. As we talked about, making sure parents understand your, the depth of your concern. Um, I really want to emphasize this next one. Use language that leaves room for parents to anticipate possible results or a more detailed evaluation. And she did this really well. She said, he may be behind other children. Um, he seems to have more difficulty with this. Sometimes we use the word, your child seems to be struggling a little bit with this or that or have vulnerabilities in these areas. So I think there are a lot of nice ways to say that a child is behind uh, that offers support for parents. Um, the last uh, few things is to try to get a sense of whether they're likely to follow through. So what can you do to help them comply with your recommendations? And all of that is about information and availability. So this is just a nice handout on some things to keep in mind when you're, when you're talking with parents. So let's move on a little bit. Um, and I have two separate videos um, of the follow-up interview. And I'm going to play the video where the family uh, is more skeptical not on board with the diagnosis rather than play the one that went more smoothly. So if we have time later and you guys want to see it, we can come back to the sort of smooth uh, follow-up interview. Uh, but I think we'll start with the one where um, Dr. Weitzman has to deal with some more difficult uh, encounters. Is everybody doing okay with these videos? Getting a chance to eat your lunch while you watch them, I hope. Um, again, I, I would ask you to please take some notes. Uh, and if you have the handout printed, maybe refer to handout three, Steps for Delivering Difficult News, and see what you think she does uh, from this handout as we go along. Otherwise, we'll review it at the end. The following video role play was staged with an actual physician and with real parents of a child with autism. In this role play, Tommy, the patient, is 30 months old. His parents are having a follow-up visit with their pediatrician. Tommy has been evaluated by a developmental specialist and the parents are questioning the diagnosis. Welcome back, it's good to see the two of you again. Uh, I wanted to meet with the two of you alone so that we could review the findings from Tommy's evaluation with the developmental pediatrician. Yes, thanks. It's a lot easier to meet when he's not here. I agree. When Tommy has tantrums, it's hard to talk around that. I'd like for us to review the letter uh, from the developmental pediatrician about the evaluation. I got a copy of that also, and I had a chance to review it before we're meeting today. So how did the evaluation go? Not very well. Tommy, he really didn't sleep that well the night before. He was kind of cranky. I really don't feel like the specialist really got a good feel for him. You know, Tommy wouldn't even look the guy in the eye. And they didn't see all what he could do. And personally, I don't think you can be diagnosed after one meeting. I mean, I don't know. We're just really upset about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I hear how disappointed you both are and how that evaluation went. And it's really frustrating when kids uh, just don't show all of their skills in front of the specialist. It is hard to imagine that they can get a good picture of him. But the specialists, you know, they are used to this and they do understand that kids are not going to show all of their skills, especially it was the first time Tommy had ever been in that office. 
Um, but they know what they're looking for, and they can still look at the very specific skills, uh, even if he's not showing all of his abilities. I just don't understand why he wasn't cooperative. I mean, Tommy looks at us, he wouldn't look at the doctor, and I don't understand why the doctor couldn't get him to look at him the way he looks at us. Mm. I can't believe he got a diagnosis in the first place. He wasn't at his best. We really didn't want to do this in the first place. Now he has a label. I'm not telling anybody about this. Yeah, you sound pretty angry about this at the moment. You know, you don't need to tell anyone else about this at this point, and that's your decision. We don't want people to think that Tommy can't do anything and putting him in a classroom with kids that has more issues than he does. I completely agree with you. So I think that the work that lay ahead is really finding the appropriate intervention for him and putting that in place so that he can develop some new skills and really flourish. You know, I need to talk to my sister about this. She's a teacher. Oh, you told me your sister had expressed some concerns. Right, and I think she can be helpful to us. I think that's great. It's wonderful that you have someone you can talk to and who can provide this kind of support. The specialist says that Tommy is pervasive development disorder, not otherwise specified. What do they mean by this? You know, this terminology is very confusing. When we talk about pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, or PDD, NOS, this falls under the umbrella of one of the autism spectrum disorders. And this involves really three areas of functioning. So um, repetitive behaviors and restricted interests, sort of like when you've told me about um, Tommy's insistence on things always being the same and being a bit rigid about things. And the second area is in communication. And Tommy's had some delays in acquiring language. I know he's gaining skills now, but he's had some delays. And then the third area is around social skills. And so that might speak to some of the things that you had indicated, remember, when you filled out the M-chat, that Tommy kind of prefers to play alone, doesn't really like it when other kids kind of invade his space. I don't agree that he's autistic. I mean, he knows way too much for that. He knows his shapes. He knows his colors. He knows his letters. He's not even three years old yet. I mean, we think he's ready for kindergarten. You're right. Tommy is such a bright and clever little boy. Um, when we talk about the autism spectrum disorders these days, we're talking about a very broad spectrum of children. And Tommy has so many abilities. He knows his shapes, he knows his colors, he's learning his letters. These strengths will really continue to serve him well as he grows. Can we talk about the diagnosis again? Like my wife said, it just doesn't add up. Yeah, let's take a step back and let's review what autism spectrum disorder means and then we can figure out what this really means for Tommy. Good, because I'm still confused. Okay, so remember there are three areas that we really focus on when we're talking about autism spectrum disorders. So the first is communication. And remember, Tommy had some delays in acquiring language. And the second area is around social interaction. And you've told me about how Tommy often prefers to be alone, to play alone. It doesn't really like it so much when kids start to invade in his space. And then the third area has to do with repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. So some of that is about what you've talked about, Tommy not really liking to have his routine interrupted. And sometimes he kind of you know, spends a lot of time sorting things and organizing things. So when we talk about an autism spectrum disorder, children are affected in all three of these areas. And I think I've given you some examples to help you understand what those might be for Tommy in each of those areas. If you're talking about shapes, he's used them to learn things. Oh, you're absolutely right. Tommy really has learned a lot by using his shapes. But at the same time, those shapes tend to preoccupy him also which means that he uses those sometimes to the exclusion of other things. And then he gets kind of stuck on that. And you both told me about how he tantrums sometimes when you try to get him to move on to using other things. And you know, Tommy doesn't always seem to be very open to other people's interests either. So what caused this? He wasn't exposed to any vaccines. My daughter is fine. There's an awful lot we still don't know about what causes autism. But the research uh, suggests that vaccines do not cause autism. Don't you think we're overdiagnosing? I mean, that's all you read about. I mean, why such the increase? You think it's something in the environment? Well, we do know that there is an increased number of children who are being diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, but this could be due to a number of different things. So, for example, 
the criteria that we are using to diagnose children has become broader, and the age that we're diagnosing kids is we're doing a better job of picking kids up earlier. And in the past, children may have been given a different diagnosis instead of an autism spectrum diagnosis, or it is possible that there is actually an increase in autism spectrum disorders. What's going to happen to Tommy? Should we put him on a special diet or vitamins? You know, I think what you're going to find is that you're going to see a lot of different kinds of recommendations um, on the internet, when you talk to other parents and friends and family, and in the books that you read. Are vitamins safe? And, I mean, should we have him tested for lead? I think it's a really good idea to have Tommy tested for lead. And if you choose to use a vitamin, use only a regular children's multivitamin. Should we have him tested for mercury? There's really no standard way to measure mercury in kids. I really don't recommend this. I think it's really important to make sure that the things that we're doing for Tommy are safe, and some of the treatments that are out there for kids are actually harmful. You know, I'm still worried. I've heard about mercury causing autism in kids. There's no evidence at this time for a role um, for mercury in causing autism. Um, what we do know is that the standardized treatments today that have been shown to be effective are early intervention. But it's really difficult for parents to try to sort through all of these different treatments that are out there and try to make sense of it. And I'd like to be available to you to help you to try to understand some of these things as you kind of go down this road. Um, you know, it's really okay that we don't have all the questions sorted out today, but I'd like to stay in touch with you about this and I'd like to follow up with you in a few weeks just to continue to hear how things are going. And I really want to thank you for coming in and just talking so openly and frankly about how you're doing with hearing all of this and going through the evaluation. And I really appreciate that you went through this evaluation even though you had a lot of reluctance to do that. So thanks for coming in today. It was good to see you. Okay. So I'd really, really like to hear you, your uh, impressions of how, how this went, um, how you feel like the body language changed or the affect of the parents changed. Um, I think it was Peggy brought up a great point that dad was not on board with having the evaluation and now they went and look what happened. He wasn't happy at all. Um, so maybe you can unmute and uh, we'll give it actually a few minutes if you have any email uh, comments or, or uh, just on the phone comments. Um, I think the doctor tried to do a very, and did a very good job with the parents trying to uh, make it as, as soft as, as possible for that information to, you know, to come to them. But um, the mom was not ready for that at all. She was, you know, the autism and the, and the things that he could do well, the shapes, and he's ready for kindergarten. And then the dad was almost going in another direction. Um, special diet, medicines, um, right. vitamins. But what can I do? Diet. What can I do to right. take this away? Yeah. Right. That's Peggy again. But I'm sure you recognize my voice is so deep. I just recognize you from last time. You signed on, I think, to one of the other webinars. So. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Appreciate you signing on. Um, so. What do you think was, what was, what were some of the challenges? I think you brought that up that uh, the parents weren't on the same page. They disagreed and they didn't necessarily agree with each other and they didn't, certainly didn't agree with the specialist who gave this PDD-NOS diagnosis. What do you think is something else that was hard for the doctor to manage while she, while she was having this conversation? I, I thought she handled it well when she realized that it was coming too fast for them and she said, well, let's, let's step back and went through everything kind of slowly again with even a little bit less detail to, to get, you know, but the parents were still, I mean, they would, I've, I've seen that. So, I mean, it's, it's hard to come back. I, I thought she tried to do a very good job. She did a good job. It just didn't work as well as it, it, it could have. 
um, because well, as a parent. It's awesome, though, that you noticed that. You know, those exact words. Okay, let's take a step back. And so she's like back at the sort of foundation of the diagnosis. And PDDNOS is no easy mouthful to explain anyway. I mean, here's this string of words that sounds so clinical. Um, pervasive developmental disorder, you know, it's sort of like one of those minimal brain disease things, like what does that mean? And I, I think I agree with you, she did a nice job taking this terminology or the medical jargon and trying to apply it to Tommy with uh, real examples of, of his behaviors. It was really nice. He, she did a lot of good tying in, like, you know, like, uh, even with the, the first uh, video versus, you know, thing about the interview versus the video um, about being shy and, and but not really wanting to pay it with other kids, that was a concern Ari did, did know. And then when he had the results for, from that socialization part of the domain that, well, that's, you know, maybe that's an attributed factor. He doesn't really want to play alone with the same repetitive, you know, or restricted, you know, interest and kind to, to kind of reaffirming what they already would told the doctor, which now the the assessment tool is kind to kind to um what's the word odd uh, before not like not fortify but reinforce that this is the same information we're now getting from a assessment tool versus an observation and parent report. And this is probably now at least the second or third time for this family, right? Because you would hope that the specialist went through what was PDDNOS and gave them some literature, and 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 they have a good enough relationship with their pediatrician to say, "I'm still confused. What does this mean?" And I I thought that was that spoke to the relationship that she had with them coming coming in, and I agree with you that she used really concrete ways of saying, like she said, I hear how worried you are at one point. I completely agree with you at one point. So that she's she's really showing that she's sort of their advocate uh, on their right. side. Very yeah. Lady, yes. Do you think there's anything she could well, have done differently? Well, it seemed like she kind of bridged a gap where she said the, that knowing his shapes and everything will give give him a lot of strength to deal with things. You right. know, to deal so with so she took one of those perseverative behaviors and, and portrayed it as a strength for them, like this will be a way he can learn and succeed. One of the things I think it's nice to do at the end of an interview like this, so you can really see what the parents are taking away, is ask them a question like, how will you explain this to your family members? Or how, you know, how would you explain this to your sister uh, when you talk with her? Because I think you really get a sense of what they're taking away and their understanding um, if you ask them to reframe it back to you, what, what the discussion has been. Um, so I think that's something that you can think about to do at, at an interview like this, too. Has anyone who's logged on um, had to give difficult news or have other ideas about how you would uh, how you would support this family, or or even if it's not around an autism diagnosis, some things that you do to help a family in this moment. Well, why I don't, don't we understand your? Oh, my question. Just has anybody had some experience doing this and have any other ideas about how you might um, communicate difficult news to a family? Peggy again, um, I know that and, and I, you know, everybody is different, but um, you know, I'm a child development specialist who's sometimes the first person with a speech language pathologist doing that, the, the, the assessment with the parents and the child, and um, those two hours are very bonding to it anyway, even though it's a wonderful, playful, and we're fun, but right. um, there's been a lot of uh, literal hand-holding and hugs and squeezes, and somebody wants a, 
and I don't know how you feel about that, but they want, you, know, you, you can't, you can tell, they, the mom or dad or, but normally it's the mom wants a, you know, somebody's going to be there, you're, gonna, you're telling them we're going to do all the things that we can, and you know, this you know, challenge, but we, you know, we're early intervention, you know, it's a key, and you come in, and we're going to, you know, go on this journey with you, but a lot of times they need to, uh, physical uh, reassurance with a, with a hug or, you know, a squeeze or, you know, you know very face-to-face, -face, you know, very a, a compassion, that they need that compassion, which, you know, I think the doctor was very compassionate with that, not doing that, but her, her, her words and stuff when they were talking. But I know that we have that. And I'm, I'm a hugger. I'm Greek and Irish. We, have, we <laughs> hug everybody. So when people look like they need a hug, it's just natural instinct and normally they will hug, hug back harder than yeah. you know that they really needed them. That's, and I think it's a way, a way of thanking you too for approaching something difficult so sensitively. It, it may oh, be a way yeah. of saying, I'm comfortable yeah. with you. Thank you for making me so comfortable with this difficult time, you know? So oh, it's a, yeah. it's well, a it tribute to you, I think, too. So. Oh, yes, definitely, yeah. So. Thank you. Um, so this is just some, you know, bullets about how steps for delivering difficult news. Um, you know, we've all seen these TV shows where you're standing in the hallway outside of the, you know, trauma room and the trauma surgeon is giving the family terrible news and uh, you just hope it'll never be like that. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, those of us who work with children and families are much more s sensitive at least to things like that. So. These are some of the features that I know instinctively you guys all do, but setting up the interview and here's some aspects of, of that. Uh, when, we in, when we call families before we set up our ESEP evaluation, we make sure they know that any family members or support, supportive people that want to come to the evaluation or the family meeting are welcome to come. Asking parents, you know, what their perceptions are. And um, this just brings up an interesting Thing. The other day, uh, we were seeing a family of a little boy who had some significant delays, and I asked the family if they had any idea about what they thought might have caused their child's delay. And they said, well, when he was seven months old, he had rolled off the bed and fallen. And I would bet that nine out of ten of us have heard that horrible thunk when our child rolled off the bed and hit the floor and cried right, right away, and we thought, oh my gosh, I didn't know they could do that yet. But this family all along for two years had thought, well, it was because he had rolled off the bed and hit his head that he was uh, having so many delays. And this was not where the child had a head injury, no loss of consciousness, no bleeding. It was just a, a you know, a, an 18 inch fall onto a floor. So I think asking the parents what their perceptions are, what they think might have caused what's happening, will help give you some avenues to talk to families uh, at the end about what, what might really uh, underlie some of the delays. Um, number three is a warning shot. Uh, I don't know about that, but just, you know, just something like she said, I'm glad I could meet with both of you together to review this. That's saying you're going to need each other's support embedded in that statement. Um, addressing parental emotion with empathy and that's why I like the videos so well instead of the type transcripts because you can see everyone's facial expression and you can see the worry that this pediatrician has for this family and the care that she has for them. Identifying the emotions that the family is is feeling. Are they angry? Are they sad? Are they, you know, we've had parents jump up and leave the room not to return to a family meeting that there was so much pent up anger and stress about the diagnosis. Um, number five I'm not necessarily agreeing with where it says explain where on the spectrum their child lies. Um, these are kind of the crystal ball questions we refer to them as like where what will my child be doing in five years and ten years and I think we need to give families hope and tell them the strengths their child has that point to good prognostic outcome. But if those strengths aren't really very evident yet, then we have to identify the strengths within the family structure and not make uh, prognostications or predictions about how the child will do. 
And then we talked about these last steps about seeing how well do the parents understand the information that you've given them, um, offer a follow-up interview or to talk with another family member, and give them really clear steps of where to proceed as they're leaving your office, like your phone number, how can they reach you, what are, what are some uh, uh, websites that are accredited, uh, that type of thing. Um, any comments about this delivering difficult news handout? Well, I see that we're nearly to one o'clock, and I'm, I just want to call your attention to one other uh, information page. And I think you brought up one of these stages, Peggy, of bargaining. So if we do hyperbaric oxygen, or we put our child on vitamins, or we uh, do a gluten-free diet, will, will that cure our child? Um, so these are some of the stages to recognize. They aren't necessarily linear. Families will go through these stages in different orders and for different lengths. But just to put them in your mind, they're adapted from the Elizabeth uh, Kubler-Ross stages of grief. And uh, families go through these when their child is diagnosed with a disability or a medical condition also. I think some of the things that are more specific to an autism diagnosis are these last five things at the end. You know, w there's so much uncertainty and there's such a wide variety of outcomes and, and underlying uh, disability with autism. So it's very hard for them to know what the future holds for them. And, um, and we really have to support these families over the long term, not just when their children are two and three and four getting diagnosed, but when they're eight and 10 and 12 and new behaviors are emerging and new challenges are emerging for these families. And some of the upcoming webinars will deal with some of those as children with an autism diagnosis age. How can we support families with some of those things like toilet training and sleep and behaviors? So those are some upcoming modules. So um, when you say that, I'm sorry. When you say that grief is likely, more likely to become chronic, mm -hmm. does that mean that they don't, they aren't able to reach acceptance? That it's just much harder to with something like this. I think it or just depends. Or just much harder the, to stay there. Yeah, I think because I mean, their children are going to live a normal lifespan, and they have the just the chronic questions of. Will my child be employable? You know, we've had families say, will my child be able to drive? Um, you know, those kind of questions. It's there as, as each milestone for a typically developing child is reached and passed and their child isn't reaching it, I think there's a whole sort of new grief process that, that re-erupts, re kind of. I don't know if anyone listening would like to speak to that as well. Any last comments or questions as we close? I would, I would love some input on these videos. I know they're long, um, but I'd like to hear your, whether they were helpful. Uh, this is Peggy. I thought they were very helpful. Um, the, the, you know, looking at a snapshot or reading a PowerPoint or even, you know, no matter how, uh, seeing it that way and the, the people, um, you know, the parents' reaction, the doctor's reaction and all that stuff. Um, it was, I just, I think that was, I will remember that information more. I think it, it just, it's just Great. the, um, the style that, that, that came and then it was very well done too. So, yeah, well, I with think the combination. The CDC, yeah, the CDC has really, really gone to a lot of trouble and created some nice videos. And again, there's a link to all the videos on their website, um, if you want to watch, uh, more, more video footage. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us. I think we are supposed to do roll call again at the end, just to see if we missed anyone uh, who wants continuing education credits. So thank you for your time and attention, and have a good afternoon. And um, I'll turn it back over to Kevin. Yes, and anyone who has not signed in or who I haven't acknowledged online, um, 
please go ahead and say your name. I think I've got everybody, but to be safe. Well, this is Diane Dennity, Frank. I'm the one who couldn't get any audio till you got me through that other way. Yes, so and we did have a, we had a few of you uh, who had some trouble getting on audio, and I'm very sorry about that. I've already notified our audio provider again. It's a known issue, and they're working on it. And thank you so much for your patience there, uh, uh, Diane. And I know there was at least one other person who had some problems, so I apologize. Anybody else who wants to sign in who has not? Okay, with that, I think we'll sign off. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you.